good evening, everyone. Thanks a million for taking time out of your busy days to join us for uh, this evening's webinar. Uh, my name is Jenny Gibbons, and I'm a dairy scientist at AHDB Dairy. And um, I'm delighted to be bringing you tonight's webinar on mineral nutrition of dairy cattle. Um, our presenter uh, tonight is uh, Liam Sinclair from uh, Harper Adams University. We have um, actually over 20 people registered for for the webinar this evening, including dairy farmers, vets, nutritionists, consultants, and researchers. I'm delighted to introduce Liam. Um, Liam is a, a farmer's son from Caithness in Scotland, and he studied for his first degree in agriculture at Aberdeen University before undertaking his PhD in ruminant nutrition and biochemistry at Nottingham. Since then, he's been the principal lecturer in dairy and at Harper, and his research interests include forage and mineral management of dairy cows at wintering systems and reducing the methane output from dairy cows. In 2011, he was awarded the British Society of Animal Sciences Sir John Hammond Award for his um, achievements in research and in teaching, and he is currently the president of the British Society of Animal Science. And over the last five years, uh, Liam has very much led um, on a number of research projects that AHDB Dairy have been funding on mineral nutrition, which you're going to hear about tonight, um, but also on reducing crude protein in dairy rations and on outwintering uh, heifers. So without further delay, really, uh, Liam, I would love to hand over the controls to you. Okay, thanks very, uh, thanks very much, Jenny. I'm going to spend about the next 25 minutes or so speaking about the area of uh, mineral uh, nutrition, and it's an area that I'm very interested in, but often I think uh, creates quite a bit of confusion amongst uh, dairy farmers and, and nutritionists, both in terms of the range of different minerals, uh, different sources, types of, of minerals, and different symptoms of mineral deficiencies and uh, excesses as well. So I'm going to go through and, um, and cover um, a number of, uh, of different things. Um, first of all, I'm going to do a little bit around how much we should be feeding and uh, what we are actually feeding. So some work that we did on behalf of EHDB Dairy to look at sort of feeding levels. Um, and then I'm going to pick up on, on three minerals. Um, I'm not going to try and cover everything within the time available, but perhaps say a little bit about these. Phosphorus, because of its, um, its major cost within the diet, but also its uh, polluting um, uh, sort of uh, risk if you overfeed. Um, copper, uh, in relation to deficiency and excess. And then finally, a little bit about cobalt, because it's uh, of interest in relation to recent EU legislation on uh, maximizing its inclusion level. And then finally, I'm going to try and take that back to sort of practical aspect and look at some uh, financial implications from that and what that means on a, on a farm basis and, and really some simple take-home messages that farmers can uh, take away and, and hopefully apply um, on farm. So how much mineral should we feed? What's, what's the optimal um, amount? Well, anybody who's looking at rationing will go and look at some form of textbook uh, and there are a variety of different recommended uh, uh, mineral allowances. Uh, we've got NRC, which is the Americans, uh, AFRC, uh, ARC, which is British, CSIRO, uh, so a whole variety of different um, um, mineral recommendations. All of these are generally based on a sort of factorial approach, so you look at how much the animal needs to maintain itself, how much for milk production, uh, reproduction, and those kind of uh, factors uh, are all uh, included within there. And if we look at that, then we end up with different sort of recommended levels. And this is our sort of simplistic uh, values here for just three minerals. So we've got calcium, phosphorus, and, uh, and copper. Uh, some minerals are presented in the form of grams per kilogram dry matter, uh, and some as milligrams per kilogram dry matter. But that really doesn't have any um, impact in terms of how important they are. So simply because we need to supply them as milligrams doesn't mean to say that they are less important. But obviously, we need to supply greater quantities of these uh, macro minerals. Uh, and this is just some NRC values here in terms of calcium, phosphorus, uh, and magnesium. And I'll be returning to these, but there are other standards as well. And really, from a practical point of view, what we want to avoid is, is underfeeding. Um, and uh, if we underfeed, then we have a variety of different um, symptoms of health and, and performance and intake, milk yield can all be affected. But equally, um, if we overfeed, then that can increase the cost of the diet. 
for certain minerals such as uh, phosphorus, and we've got uh, sort of environmental aspects which are increasingly important. Some major areas, uh, dairy areas of the world, such as California, then is actually the uh, pollution of dairy cows, um, which is one of the major um, inhibitions in terms of expanding their dairy industry. So it shouldn't be underestimated. But also aspects of health and performance, which I'll come back to. So really, we want to be somewhere in between uh, these, not uh, uh, some undersupplying, but equally not oversupplying as well. So a few years ago, we decided um, to actually survey and look to see, well, what are UK dairy farmers uh, actually feeding in relation to these uh, values? Are we generally underfeeding or, or overfeeding? So we went out onto uh, 50 uh, dairy herds, uh, mainly throughout the Midlands and the north of England. Uh, they were quite typical in terms of milk yield, a little bit uh, larger than uh, the average herds, but they were quite um, uh, typical in terms of the milk yield and the range of milk yield. And we did a number of things when we were on farm. Uh, we took samples of what was actually being fed. So uh, if that was a total mix ration, we took that for the lows and the highs. We took forages if they were being supplied separately. We took parlor concentrates. Um, and we took water supply as well. And I'll, I'll come back to water because that's often an, an underestimated component within the, uh, the mineral supply. And we also collected uh, details on supplementary mineral sources and levels. And that's really to give us a, an overall uh, true picture of what animals are actually consuming, rather than just what the diet is formulated on. I'll, I'll come back to that point a little bit later. If we look at some of the results, then, um, and I'll start with water, because that's often one that's uh, ignored in terms of mineral supply. And the mineral content of the water varied considerably. Um, here we've got um, the 50 dairy farms along the bottom. And this is, uh, I've expressed the uh, contribution from water that we estimated as the percentage of the calcium requirements. And for most herds, that's, that's relatively low and, and not something you really want to be too concerned about. But for some herds, it could be a major contributor. Now, this is important for lactating cows, but also it's important for dry cows. Uh, for two reasons. First of all, we tend to uh, provide them with dry diets and therefore they consume more water, so it has a greater uh, proportional effect. But also we're aware of oversupplying uh, calcium in terms of um, um, hypocalcemia uh, in dry cows as well, so milk fever. So it's, in some forms, it's something we may want to be aware of. Other ones as well, uh, magnesium for most herds, not a major contributor, but for some herds um, it was. And, and these herds varied in terms of whether they were boreholes or whether they were, were main supply. There was a variety of different uh, systems within there. And sodium as well uh, could supply um, a reasonable amount. So water shouldn't be something that, that we ignore. And within the overall picture, uh, it's worth knowing what's actually uh, coming uh, from that supply. If we look at the, the overall supply then, so when we added all these different components up, so what was being fed in the parlor to what was being fed out of the parlor, supplementary sources, water, etc., then we express those as a percentage of the requirements. So rather than me expressing it here as milligrams or grams per kilogram dry matter, I've just expressed it in this graph here as a percentage of requirements. It makes it a little bit easier to see. And what we can see is that for all the minerals here, and we, we analyze for more than this, but the ones I've presented here, that generally they're all in excess. The one that is perhaps closest um, is phosphorus, and I'll come back to phosphorus. It was about 20 to 25% above requirements. But other ones, such as copper, which is uh, one of the minerals I'm going to be coming back to, uh, was about two and a half times uh, the amount that we needed uh, to supply. Some of the herds, about 10 or so of the ones that we surveyed were organic. And in theory, organic herds should be uh, closer to requirements because they need a, a derogation to supplement with minerals. But when we actually looked at organic herds, we found that uh, they were very similar to what the, the general pattern was for all herds. Uh, the caveat being that there were only 10 herds within this organic subgroup, but they weren't tremendously different. A little bit lower in, in copper, a little bit higher in something like potassium because of the, the forage component, but generally the pattern is there. So this is common across uh, all systems. But that doesn't mean that all herds are over supplementing, and I don't want to give that, that impression. Um, on the uh, next graph, uh, next table here, there's quite a, a, a bit of data on there, and I don't want to confuse and, and make it um, uh, difficult to understand, but this is the NRC requirement, so we have a little bit of a range here depending on milk yield, etc. And this is the mean values that we found from our survey. And this is the minimum and the maximum. 
So you can see that there's still some herds out there that are uh, undersupplying, although the mean is considerably above requirements, uh, but there's some herds that are, are grossly oversupplying on these uh, major minerals. And the one I particularly want to focus on is phosphorus, and I'm going to be coming back to phosphorus in relation to its importance and why we should be uh, looking at getting these, these levels correct. Similarly, for the what we call the trace minerals, those that are supplied in milligrams per kilogram dry matter, again, uh, some herds are undersupplying. So here we can see in this situation uh, some herds are undersupplying in zinc. Copper was generally being oversupplied in, in all of them. Um, and cobalt, um, again, there weren't really any that were being undersupplied there. Uh, cobalt, I'm going to come back to at the end of the, uh, of the presentation, but I'm going to say a little bit more about copper um, for a number of reasons. Um, copper is a, a very good, uh, what I'd call, iceberg indicator in terms of our mineral nutrition. Uh, if we feed uh, too little, we can get deficiencies, but if we uh, start to feed too much, then we can start to get signs of uh, toxicity um, as well. So if we can get copper right, then generally we can get most other minerals correct as well. So in relation to copper, if we focus uh, a little bit more on that, this is uh, the, the dry cow level. So um, although those were the lactation cow diets, maybe they're being compensated for uh, by feeding less during the dry period. And we also surveyed uh, the dry cow diets uh, on the farms that we visited. And you can see that copper here, again, expressed as a percentage of requirements is still being um, oversupplied. Uh, zinc uh, was about four times the amount of what was actually required. Manganese was even higher at about six times, and cobalt was about 10 times the amount. So um, we don't have a period really in the cow cycle where we are actually uh, under supplying. So this over supplementation is going across the whole production uh, cycle. Focusing uh, back a little bit again on, on copper, so this is our 50 uh, farms along, uh, along the x-axis uh, here. Uh, and then we've got dietary copper level going up uh, the y-axis. So this is milligrams per kilogram dry matter. And I've got three different lines here. Uh, this uh, equates to roughly what the animals should be uh, uh, supplied, so about 11 uh, milligrams per kilogram dry matter. 20 is what the uh, UK feed industry has said should be the maximum amount uh, under for the vast majority of herds that we should be feeding. And 40 is uh, the EU uh, maximum level. So feeding above that is uh, uh, illegal, effectively. But this value has actually changed. And the, the least, most recent EU directive is to reduce this down to 34 milligrams, so down to this level here, uh, so lower than what it used to be. But even at 40, we had 66 out of the 50 herds, about 12%, who were over-supplementing. So they were uh, supplying levels that were illegal. And if we come down to 34, that increases to about 10, so about a fifth of herds uh, who were over-supplementing. And about 80% were feeding above what the UK feed industry uh, uh, would itself recommend as being necessary, and all of them were feeding above um, what requirements were. In terms of later lactation, um, generally lower levels in later lactation, we can start to see some herds now that were um, uh, actually under supplementing, although on average they were still um, supplying the um, above requirements over the whole lactation cycle. But we still have two that were supplying above 14. If we drop that down to 34, we would be about five or six here above that. It would be nice if um, the, uh, this herd here uh, was balanced with this one here, but this herd here happened to be the same one that was supplying in later lactation as well. And in late lactation, round about 27 were feeding above the, uh, the UK uh, recommended level. So an over-supplementation um, from that perspective. So is that, uh, is that a problem? Well, we know that uh, there are um, a, a consistent number of herds who have outbreaks of copper toxicity. Uh, but this was a survey that was done by Nottingham University where they looked at cull cattle um, at a single abattoir and they looked at uh, liver copper levels. Now, liver copper levels are a good indicator in terms of overall um, copper supply. What the cow tends to, to do is that when she's supplied with more copper, she will store that in the liver. And if she is fed lower levels of copper, she will mobilize it from the liver. So the liver can be quite a good way of determining uh, that. And if, if anybody uh, wants to determine whether they are uh, at risk of over or under supplying, 
then either taking a liver biopsy, which is what a uh, vet can do, or perhaps more easily taking, getting a sample from cull cows uh, at uh, the abattoir can be a useful way of determining that. Now these values don't really uh, matter too much in terms of what the absolute values are. I'm, I'm more important in terms of what these definitions are here. So this is deficient, so they're, they're undersupplied, normal, high, and toxic levels. So toxic levels in relation to the cow, but also in terms of anybody who's consuming them, uh, those livers as well. And this is for dairy cows and beef cows. And we can see that in terms of dairy cows, around about 40% of cows going through slaughterhouse were uh, being, um, had either high or toxic levels of copper within their livers. Some herds, as I mentioned, are still uh, undersupplied, so I don't want to give the impression that every herd is. Uh, some are undersupplied. We've virtually got the flip side if we look at beef cows, in contrast, where there are a large number of cows who are actually deficient and uh, considerably less who are either high or toxic. So certainly with dairy cows, we're perhaps killing them with kindness by uh, oversupplying, and that has an effect not only on, on the cows in terms of toxicity, but also in terms of anybody who's happened to be consuming those, uh, those livers. But we also feel that there may be a bigger problem than that. Uh, we feel that uh, these cows with these high levels, even those that don't show uh, clinical uh, toxicity signs, may also uh, be impaired in terms of their uh, performance, particularly their health and immunity. And that's what we're currently investigating. We're taking heifers through their whole production uh, life up until their first lactation and feeding them uh, different levels of copper and looking at what the subsequent effect may be on immunity and health because there is some suggestions that this high levels here, even if the cows aren't showing, aren't uh, actually dying as a consequence, may actually have impaired immunity. So moving away a little bit from uh, from copper, I will come back to it in, in a few minutes. Um, one of the ones that I, I mentioned was uh, was phosphorus, um, and phosphorus is is important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, if we look at uh, this shows uh, uh, world rock phosphate uh, production, and this is what the uh, predicted um, levels of supply are going to be. And some people uh, would argue that uh, we're going to run out of phosphate before we run out of crude oil. And you can see that we have, have, re have reached the peak of phosphate production and it's beginning to come down. Now, inevitably, that will result in increased uh, prices, um, which in itself may increase supply from other sources. But nevertheless, we are looking at an increased uh, potential cost of phosphorus within the diet. Traditionally, we fed uh, phosphorus at quite high levels, um, and there's quite a bit of evidence to show that phosphorus is uh, important in terms of intake and important in terms of aspects of uh, reproduction. But it's really its issues relating to its cost and the environmental impact uh, that is important. And there been several studies done over the last number of years looking at, uh, at phosphorus, and I'm going to focus on one that was done in, in Northern Ireland. And these are these are long-term studies that are quite expensive to do and, and uh, take a long time to do, but they are important questions that need to be, uh, need to be answered. And this is work that, that they did where they fed uh, two different levels. Uh, this is 3.6 grams per kilogram dry matter, is roughly what NRC would say what the cows require. And 4.4 was roughly what we found from our survey that the average UK cow was getting. So that's more fortuitous than by design, but these were the two levels that they looked at. So over the four years, what did they find? Um, well, what they found is that uh, milk yield was not significantly affected between the two different levels. Milk fat content and milk protein were also similar. Depth of rib, which is an indication of whether we've actually got any uh, a bone difference between because of phosphorus involvement, then there's no significant difference. And similarly, calving interval uh, was not significantly different um, between the two. Slightly higher here, but it was um, not even approaching significant. So no effect in terms of, of um, reproduction. The major difference was that cows that were fed more phosphorus excreted more phosphorus. And this increase here, although it may look relatively small difference, was equivalent to around about 10 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare. And that's quite important in terms of NVZ regulations and in terms of derogations if you're an old grass farm. But effectively what was happening is that the more phosphorus that was being fed was being excreted, potentially causing pollution, but not having any major effect in terms of uh, performance or reproduction. 
So moving back uh, in terms of uh, of copper, and I said that copper was quite a good iceberg indicator in terms of of getting the um, um, overall mineral level correct. And uh, copper responsive disorders um, are the most common trace element deficiency. So if you if you look at um, sort of uh, veterinary lab reports, and the most common one that comes through is animals that are deficient in copper. So it's it's important that we don't um, undersupply. And signs of deficiency are quite varied. Copper is involved in over 300 different enzymes. It has a whole range of different effects, and, and there isn't really any clinical sign, although there are certain things such as pigmentation because of its involvement, and uh, sort of the classical ones would be circles around the eye, and you can get discoloration across the coat. But these are um, um, quite extreme uh, if you're at that, that position. Reproduction can be affected, and certainly if you are deficient, then supplying extra copper can improve that. Growth, immune function, cardiac failure, changes in bones and joints are all important. So it's important that we don't undersupply, but although copper, as I mentioned, is the most widely reported deficiency, it's also the most widely reported toxicity. And it's because of this um, um, absorption by the, and storage by the liver uh, and the liver gets to a situation where it can't store anymore, uh, goes into a bit of a crisis, releases all the copper, and uh, basically you end up with uh, with dead cows uh, as a consequence. But often there are very few symptoms of that up until you actually get clinical cases. So what about copper um, um, in terms of um, making sure that we get the right levels? Well, we can get a what's called a primary uh, copper deficiency, and that's where we haven't supplied sufficient copper within the diet. And that tends to be less of a problem in the UK. Uh, most rations are, are adequate, as we saw from our survey. Most uh, dairy cow rations are actually well in excess. But even in terms of grazing situations, um, it wouldn't be that usual that the actual uh, diet was low in copper. Not impossible, but not, uh, not very often would you get that. So it's not usually because there is insufficient copper within the diet that you end up with a responsive disorder. What is a lot more common is the fact that uh, copper uh, interacts with a number of other minerals. And that's, that's what can make mineral nutrition a little bit more confusing or interesting, depending on what your perspective is. And a number of uh, minerals can interact with copper and, and uh, prevent its uh, absorption or affect its metabolism, uh, including zinc uh, and iron. But perhaps the two most common would be molybdenum and sulfur. And what happens with molybdenum and sulfur is that they uh, form within the rumen, they form uh, a thigh molybdate that binds uh, very strongly with copper and prevents it from being absorbed um, across into the animal. And there's also a school of thought that these thigh molybdates uh, may also be absorbed into the, uh, into the bloodstream and affect copper-containing enzymes, although that's a little bit more of a, of a controversial area. So therefore, herds uh, who are grazing pastures or have silages that they know are high in molybdenum sulfur may justify those high levels, um, may justify higher levels of feeding copper because of these antagonists, because these antagonists are preventing the availability. So we looked back at our data again, and we wanted to see whether herds that had high levels of these antagonists were feeding higher levels of copper, which would be quite logical. So when we did that, so this is one of the major ones here, dietary molybdenum, and this is dietary copper on the y-axis here. So what you'd expect is that herds that are feeding high, that had not feeding, these are background levels, nobody would be supplementing with, with molybdenum, but herds that had higher levels of background molybdenum should be feeding higher levels of copper. And those with lower levels of molybdenum should be feeding uh, lower levels of copper. And in fact, what we found was uh, the exact opposite that uh, really there was no uh, pattern there. The herds that had the lowest levels of molybdenum, so down here, were feeding some of the highest levels of copper, and those that had uh, some of the highest levels of molybdenum were feeding the lowest levels of copper. Although this level here would still be sufficient, even at these high levels of molybdenum, would still be sufficient uh, to meet the animal's requirements. So there's no real relationship between molybdenum and dietary copper concentrations. So despite the fact that these antagonists can have an effect, uh, there really wasn't a lot of evidence that people were taking that uh, into account in any, any major form. So what else uh, can affect uh, copper uh, status? Well, one thing that we uh, felt from our survey was that there seemed to be a difference in terms of different forages that were being fed. 
So we did a we did a study at Harper Adams where we looked at two different uh, basal forages. Uh, we looked at a maize silage basal forage, and we looked at a grass silage basal forage. Uh, the animals were supplemented with concentrates as well, but the, the major difference was these two um, uh, basal forages. And we fed quite a high level of copper, around about 19 milligrams uh, per kilogram dry matter. Uh, if you remember, the recommended or the required level is around about 11, so we're, we're well above that, still under the uh, industry recommended maximum, but nevertheless well above what the animals should require. So the animals should have been in positive copper balance. And then we supplemented these diets either with these antagonists that I mentioned, so sulfur and molybdenum, either without or with. And this is uh, sulfur here. Uh, generally, sulfur levels in the diet would be around about two. So we're supplying nearly twice as much sulfur uh, within the diet. Molybdenum levels are generally around about one to one and a half in most diets. And we uh, added another seven. So this is now a really high level of molybdenum. So these are sort of experimental levels that, uh, that you would get. And in fact, most pastures and forages are actually decreasing in, in sulfur rather than increasing. So these are quite experimental levels, just to provide high levels of these antagonists. So what are defined? Well, if, if we look at the maize-based ration, so um, here, this is the maize ones, either without the antagonists or with the antagonists, so maize with molybdenum and sulfur. And you can see there's no effect on, on intake. Uh, milk yield, uh, if anything, was numerically higher with the uh, antagonist, but there was no significant difference. Uh, but importantly, there was no effect on plasma copper levels. So when we looked at plasma copper levels, they were both uh, well above what you'd um, um, require uh, in terms of the basal level, and they were very similar between the two. This other one down below here, this is uh, what's called seroloplasmin that some people look at, and it's looking at the, the ratio of it. It's one of the enzymes that contains copper within the blood. And again, there was no difference uh, between those. So no indication from that that the animals had any difference in terms of copper supply. So if a vet came out and took a blood sample uh, from these animals, he wouldn't tell the difference between the two groups. What about the grass silage based ration? So the same treatments, the same amount of, of sulfur and molybdenum, but now a grass silage based ration. And here the animals did um, respond quite differently. And um, here we can see that intake was around about two kilograms of dry matter less. Milk yield was slightly lower, but it was not significantly different. So there's no difference in terms of milk yield. Body condition score was, was lower. Um, and also, so was uh, milk somatic cell count was, was higher. Now, whether the cell count was higher because of the molybdenum or sulfur, or whether it was higher because of the reduced intake, is more difficult to say. But similar to the previous um, uh, table, there was no a difference in terms of plasma copper levels. So if, if the vet had come out and taken a sample, uh, it wouldn't, no, wouldn't detect any difference. And also the seroloplasmin levels here. But the, the cell counts were higher. This is based in log to the base 10 here as a, as a way of analyzing it. But nevertheless, it's, it was significantly higher in cows with the uh, grass silage and uh, with the molybdenum sulfur. So the question is, why, why is that the case? And what other differences were there there? Well, I mentioned looking at liver copper levels. And in this study, we took um, um, liver samples at the beginning of the study and then at the end of the study period. And we measured how much copper was in there. So this is looking at the change in liver copper over the, um, the study period. And these values don't really matter too much. But if they're above the line, it means the animal's storing copper. And if they're below the line, then the animal is mobilizing copper. And you can see that on both the maize diet and the grass silage based diet, without the antagonist, that they are um, both in positive, which is what we'd expect. We said we're supplying 19 milligrams of copper, which is well above requirements, and not a big difference between the two different forages. But when we looked at the antagonists, there was quite a big difference. Those on the maize silage based ration uh, were still in positive copper balance. So the 19 milligrams was still sufficient, even with these super nutritional levels of sulfur and molybdenum within there. But the grass silage based animals, they were in quite highly negative um, uh, liver copper. So they're mobilizing lots. So big difference in terms of metabolism. Now, we're not sure why that should be the case. Uh, we've got another study plan where we want to come back and revisit this. We feel it might be something to do with the rumen pH and the formation of these thiobolibdate that I mentioned. But we feel it's important that we do try and understand a little bit more of this mechanism uh, so that we can um, indicate to farmers what level they should be feeding. Because here, uh, with these high levels of antagonists, 
no benefit to feeding above 20 milligrams, but here there may be. So something that I think we need to uh, we need to further address. Just to finish off with, because I'm getting near near the end of, of the time, I just want to say a little bit about cobalt and vitamin B12. And um, cobalt um, is an interesting mineral. It's not really the cow that requires the cobalt. Um, what actually requires the cobalt is the rumen microbes. And we rely on these rumen microbes to produce a variety of B vitamins. And it's vitamin B12 that's in, that is important in relation to uh, cobalt. And the cow needs vitamin B12, but she can get vitamin B12 unless the rumen microbes have got sufficient cobalt in there to synthesize it. So what's vitamin B12 required for? Well, in round about uh, the, the calving period, the transition period, the important thing that vitamin B12 is involved with is production of glucose. And the cow needs to produce large quantities of glucose to make the main milk sugar, which is lactose. And if she hasn't got enough glucose, then we can end up with symptoms such as ketosis and fatty liver syndrome. Other types of vitamin B12 are also involved in amino acid metabolism, and that can be important in relation to a variety of different things, such as um, 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 hoof hardness and also in terms of energy metabolism as well. But the main thing in terms of the transition period would be this production of glucose and potential effects of ketosis. So what's the interest in terms of cobalt? Why is that of interest? Well, uh, deficiency symptoms would include inappetence, so the cow is not eating as much, fatty liver syndrome, and ketosis. And the reason it's of interest is that there's been a recent EU um, um, directive that has said that uh, has limited the amount of cobalt that we can add to the diet. And that's not really been done from a cow health perspective. That's been done from a human operator perspective in terms of those handling uh, the minerals within uh, the feed mill and, and mixing minerals uh, because of its carcinogenic effects. So cobalt can be quite carcinogenic, and to limit the amount that's being used, the EU have come out with this. And the maximum level is around about 0.34 milligrams per kilogram dry matter that you can add to the diet. So the recommended level is 0.11 and the maximum amount that you can add is 0.34. Um, and you might begin to wonder now, well, why is there a problem if you can still add three times the amount uh, of the recommended level? And the maximum total in the diet, so that includes all the different dietary sources, and some feeds are higher than others, it actually goes up to 1.1. So in theory, this limitation shouldn't be having a major negative effect in terms of cow performance. But a number in the feed industry, because they now can't feed as much as they used to, and, and if we remember some of the previous figures are feeding well above these levels, um, then there's been some concern that, in fact, we would be having a particular problem with ketosis, especially in high-yielding cows. So we did a study uh, where we looked at feeding uh, four different treatments to, to cows, um, prepartum and postpartum. The control, we didn't supplement with any cobalt or vitamin B12. That was just a natural background level, and we tried to select ingredients that were low in cobalt and vitamin B12. CD is uh, cobalt added to the diet, so adding 0.2. We could have added more than that, but we decided to add at 0.2. BD is adding uh, dietary vitamin B12, which some companies offer, and this was predicted to supply a similar uh, tissue supply as this treatment here. So we did some calculations um, to try and estimate that this was going to supply the same as this. And then finally we had a sort of positive control where we actually went in and we injected the cows with uh, vitamin B12 to make sure that they were being supplied sufficient. Although obviously the, the rumen wasn't getting that supply but the cows were. So what did we find? So this is weeks pre and post calving. So this is eight weeks and the cows were dried off. And this is uh, calving at week zero. And then we got to eight weeks post. And this is uh, plasma ketones. Uh, so this is something if you took blood samples, you could measure. You can also measure ketones in, in milk uh, dip tests as well. So it's something that farmers can actually measure uh, as an indicator of, of uh, ketosis. But we took blood samples because we could take blood samples. And you can see that there's a variation over time, that they increased around about calving, they came back down again, and then they went up again as milk yield increased. Uh, so there's a bit of fluctuation and noise around there, but there's no difference between the four different treatments. They all perform pretty similarly, so no major difference between these different levels of uh, cobalt uh, within the diet. 
The other one would be glucose. It's more controlled in the cow than what uh, ketones are, but um, uh, glucose levels, again, didn't vary as much. Uh, slight dip there on, on that treatment, but there was no significant difference between those. We looked at plasma and vitamin B12, which were higher when we injected it, but there was little effect on other indicators of health and performance. So we looked at liver fat levels and we didn't really get an effect. We looked at body condition score. Again, it varies round about uh, between up to calving, but no significant difference between treatments. In fact, it dipped a little bit quicker with the injection than the other ones, but no difference apart from that. What about the cow's performance? Well, this is uh, postpartum, so intake, we can see here, no significant difference. Milk yield, no difference, although you might say that's beginning to get a little bit low in the control, but supplying this uh, uh, 0.2 milligrams uh, got rid of any effect, but there's no significant difference between those or in milk fat levels. So overall, there was no major difference. So our sort of conclusions would be that um, supplementing at levels that are within the legal uh, maximum are still going to be more than sufficient for what the cows require. So what about cost implications? Well, I'm not saying to feed less, but really to feed the, the, the correct levels. And uh, just some rough calculations, it depends on what value you want to put on a, a ton of minerals and what feed rate you have. Uh, but if you were to reduce it by 25%, which was uh, the mineral that was uh, least in excess, which was phosphorus, then that would save around about £8.90 uh, per cow or just over £1,000 per annum. The other thing that um, I would recommend is to do a forage mineral analysis because um, that can supply a considerable amount of minerals and be variable both uh, from year to year but field to field as well. And at around about £35 a sample and six samples per year, then if you take the net saving, it's around about £1,000 um, over the, uh, the whole herd. Another benefit that have been there would be uh, reduction in environmental aspects and reduction in, in terms of risk of animal health in terms of toxic levels of copper and potentially these things that I, I mentioned in terms of, of immunity. So in conclusion, what can we say? Well, on most herds, they're supplemented well in excess of requirements, but not all herds. So the important thing is really to know what's being fed on an individual farm. And for copper, the current industry recommendation of 20 milligrams per kilogram dry matter is more than sufficient for the vast majority of herds. Any deviation from that should only really be done if you know that there is a known problem there and to do it knowing what's in, in the basal forage. Forage source affects copper status. As we mentioned, we don't fully understand why, but we think it may be more to do with rumen pH. And we have a study where we'll be putting uh, pH boluses in cows and measuring their, their pH and the copper status. Forage analysis, I would recommend, is a good starting point. Um, often people who over supplement don't take into account all the different sources. They don't include the um, uh, supplementary levels of minerals or water. And often many don't take uh, the forage analysis into account. It, it's not very expensive, uh, not that much different to having a normal uh, forage analysis done. And for cobalt, the recommended levels are more than sufficient um, for what the animal would actually require. And finally, I would, um, if we look at cases particularly with copper toxicity um, as to why that actually occurred, often it's because nobody was an overall uh, charge or responsibility for the mineral nutrition. Somebody maybe formulated the ration, someone else maybe decided to get some free access minerals, someone else maybe decided to use some bolus, particularly on heifers or grazing animals, and when you added them all up, that's where the problem was coming. So one person needs to be responsible. Okay, I'll just finish on that. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much, um, Liam. I'd like to um, sincerely thank you for your, your time tonight and to deliver this uh, uh, webinar. We've had some uh, great um, um, thank you messages come through um, on the chat box. So um, and thanks from me and thanks from everybody um, at home listening.